Thanks for watching today at wildwoodchurch.com. Now here's today's message. Good morning, church. Turn your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. My name is Brian Smith, the lead pastor here, one of the elders. Boy, what a wonderful Sunday, isn't it? Not only is every Sunday ought to be wonderful because we've come into the presence of the Lord to worship our holy creator, King, but today is especially wonderful because Wildwood is debt free. I, I nailed that, didn't I? I nailed that. That was on, was it on key? All right. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. Yes. 25 years ago, faithful people at Wildwood Church says, you know what? We need to expand. We need to step out in faith. We need to do something big. We believe the Lord is asking us to begin to receive donations, to take pledges, to take commitments, to build a massive building. And that building that you now call the gym and our office space and, and the youth room and all of that space that has been insurmountable. Is that the right word? I, I don't, it's been pivotal. It's been pivotal. I'll get my words here in a second. To the ministry of this church, it's provided innumerable opportunities to minister to people, has been a blessing. And now, 25 years after they saw that vision, we bring the loan, the cost of that building to a close. Just get ready, okay, because there's going to be plenty of opportunities to do that. Two weeks ago, well, let's back up. Three and a half years ago, the leadership of our church was making leadership decisions based on how the bank would view our finances next year. Three and a half years ago, we were making ministry decisions based on how the bank would look at our finances next year. And we said, we, we have to be out from under the thumb of the bank. And so what, what are we going to do? Well, we're going we're gonna to have a balloon. You know, why, why does the bank matter? Because we'd have to refile. We'd have to file for a new loan next September for $309,000. And I said, that is $1,200 per family over four and a half years. That's like $300 a year per family. We can do that. And we can tell the bank, thank you for the loan, but beat it. We don't need another one. And so we presented that and, and probably didn't do it well, but we had a big case up here with a bunch of ping pong balls, and each ball represented $200 in debt. And we started with 4,000 balls, $800,000 in debt three and a half years ago. And we said every month we're transferring 50 balls, $10,000 of principal every month. That's our mortgage payment. That's in the budget. But we want to transfer more than that with your $1,200 total gift. And we met that goal. We exceeded that goal by $2,000 a year and two months early. And we celebrated that at the end of July. And do you remember I stood up here and I said, what a wonderful celebration. And 15 months from now, I'll come back and we'll burn the note because we'll make 15 more monthly payments, paying down the $140,000 that remains. That was the end of July that we made that announcement. And in the back of my mind, I wanted to say, unless we pay it off early. The Lord had put that in my mind, unless we pay it off early. A few weeks later, once again, the leadership body is making decisions, ministry decisions, uh, based on finances. And that's, we have to do that. We have to balance a budget. That's, that's our responsibility. But we're we're, there was a knee jerk because we didn't make general fund, and so how do we go into preserve and protect mode? And I said, let me lead our people to, to faithfully fulfill the, the budget next year. And what if we asked our people to pay off the debt? What if we asked our people to raise $140,000 in the next two weeks? And I'll tell you that it, was, it, it sort of scared me as it came out of my mouth. Because when you ask people to do that, when you stand on this platform 
and you say, I believe the Lord is calling us to do that, and you put yourself out there, the thought runs through your mind, what if we don't? What if I stood here today? I probably wouldn't talk about it if we didn't make it. What if we didn't? That was my fear. What if we didn't? Folks, that's every faith step. Pastor Andy talked about this woman that was healed, and she shared it on our faith, uh, on, our, on our All Things in Common, our internal Facebook page. If you don't know what that is, talk to someone that's, you know, that, that has been here for a while, and they'll tell you. She shared this, so I'm sure I have her permission, though I didn't ask. But she put out there, please pray for us. Please, please pray for me, because tomorrow I have to go have emergency surgery I have to go have emergency surgery. And so my wife said, Brian, we should go over there and pray for her. Thursday night, 9 o'clock, come on. Babe. I mean, like I've already got my sleeping shorts on. <laughs> and you want, you want me to get out and you want me to go over there and, and, and what, pray for, pray for peace in the, in the surgery? Pray for recovery, quick and, and, and speedy, full recovery? And I knew what we ought to pray for. And, you know, from, from, from us, you know, my growing up Southern Baptist, this conservative Baptist, it's a stretch to go over and pray, God, we are asking you to heal this woman tonight. We are asking you, Lord, to bring healing to her tonight. And it was a conversation with her and her husband. Do you believe this? Are you agreeing with us that, that that's what we're asking? And, and we agreed, and we asked the Lord... And brother and sister, she went back to the doctor and there was no surgery. Now I say all of this to tell you that the Lord is stretching my faith. The Lord is stretching me the way that he stretches all faithful people. Right? You think Peter wasn't stretched whenever the, the offer was get out of the boat and walk on water with me? Then the Lord says... Ask your people to pay off the building. $140,000 in 10 days in a year that you did not meet general budget. And we gave an illustration. We had a tug rope up on stage, and Josh was up here representing the sizable challenge of our $140,000 mortgage. And we had George over here on this side, little five-year-old George, standing over here pulling with all of his might. And we said, who's going to help George? George. And it's a beautiful moment that many of you came up on stage, and some of you just wanted to pull against Josh. <laughs> but others of you, 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 you saw it, you felt the moment, you said, and that is membership, that is partnership, that's what we're called to do, pull together. And the request was not that those that are already giving would pull harder, that those that are giving financially would already would, would pull harder against the mortgage, but rather that more people would put their hand on the rope and pull in the same direction. And brother and sister, that's exactly what happened. And so I told you that whenever we paid it off, I'd come up here and I would burn the mortgage. Now I learned that that's not exactly how it works. You know, there's administration that goes into all of this stuff. And you know, I told Carla, right, give me the note. And she came out with a copy, a 50-page copy of the mortgage note. And I was like, well, that, we tried to light that on fire, and it didn't exactly burn. And I said, well, what are we going to do then? So we went and, and got an official. <laughs> it is verified with a really real seal signed by the bank. Acme Mortgage. And folks, we're going to light it up. And we're going to watch it disappear. Amen. Folks, we do this because people heard the call of God. Y'all getting nervous yet? Me too. Me too. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We did that because you heard the call. And I don't think that I was the only one whose faith was stretched in this. I know countless of you 
did not know where money would come from to pay that. I didn't. Countless of you said, you know what, Lord? I'm going to step out in faith. Thank you. Church, I could not be more proud to be your pastor. I could not love you, church, more than I love you. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Now, let me talk to you about this ex- exciting building campaign. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. says, now let's start in verse 1 because we're in the middle of a thought here. So Romans chapter 1, 1 through 4, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come and we give you praise and glory. You own the cattle on a thousand hills. You are our provider. I pray, Lord, that everyone who gave, who prayed and said, Lord, do you want me to give? If so, how much? I trust you. Everyone that did that, I pray, Jesus, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are their provider. I pray, Lord, that you would fill up their, their sails with, with the wind of the Holy Spirit, that, he would, that, that, that Holy Spirit, you would move them, propel them in the faith, that you would stretch us and increase our faith. I, I echo the disciples, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I pray now that you would bless the preaching of your word and the reception of it. In Jesus' name, amen. So the gospel of God was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. That's what Paul says. Long ago, long before Paul's day, Paul was about 2,000 years ago, long before that, prophets spoke of a coming Messiah. They, and they desired to see the fulfillment of it. They, they wanted to, to see with their own eyes what the Holy Spirit caused them to see with their hearts. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what the person or time, the Spirit of Christ in them, was indicated when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. They longed to see it. Notice that Peter says that it was the Spirit of Christ. As we go through Romans, we're going to see that Paul uses the name Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, and Christ interchangeably. Why? Because there's such unity within the Trinity. And so Peter says that the Spirit of Christ was revealing to them long ago what was going to take place in the person and in the time of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 16, 26, Paul again refers to the prophetic teachings, the writings of the prophets to deliberately attach his gospel message to the Old Testament. The gospel does not supplant the Old Testament. It doesn't replace it. What does it do? It fulfills it. The Old Testament was about God making a promise to his people and revealing to them how much his people need that promise, specifically the promised Christ the promised Messiah. And the New Testament is a revelation of God fulfilling the promise and inviting us to freely receive it. The problem is that it didn't fulfill the Old Testament the way that the Jews, or the Gentiles for that matter, expected. And it still trips people up. Because the reality is 
that no one expects or can reason or justify that the holy creator God would step into flesh and would take your and my punishment upon himself. That is why the Bible tells us that we are saved by grace through faith, because it is an inexplicable message of salvation. Man has written all kinds of explicable gospels, how to be saved, how to save yourself. We can explain how we can earn our own righteousness, at least we think we can. And literally every other message than the gospel is a message of you making your way to this holy God. But what we cannot explain and what we must receive only by faith is a holy God coming to us and receiving us to himself. Paul uses the term holy scriptures or sacred scriptures only here. In his 13 letters, this is the only instance in which Paul refers to holy scriptures. I think that he wants to set all of his argument on the firm foundation of the Word. And even though people have lost confidence in the Word today, the reality is that that doesn't affect the veracity of the Word. Maybe you've heard that quip, or maybe you've seen it on a bumper sticker. God's Word says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Right? You've heard that before? Well, it's got one too many clauses. It doesn't matter if I believe it or not. It's better stated, God's Word says it, and that settles it. God's Word is authoritative, inerrant, and inspired from Genesis to Revelation. So Paul establishes, this. we're still in the salutation, we're still in the greeting And Paul wants to say, my message is rooted, is seated on God's Word, the Holy Scriptures. Don't be ashamed, brother and sister, to say God's Word says. Now, you may not find acceptance in the world, but that doesn't change. The fact that that our relativist culture rejects God's objective truth does not change the fact that it is objectively true. Amen? Amen? Verse 3, Paul says the gospel that is about God and from God, you see the gospel of God, it's both about and from, we talked about that last week, the gospel that is about God and from God, which was promised long ago, was concerning His Son, God's Son. The gospel is the good news that God sent His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should have everlasting life should not perish, should not die spiritually, should not be separated from God forever in a real place called hell, but rather dwell with Him eternally in a real place called heaven. That is the message. It is a message about God's one and only Son. And this message or this plan to send His Son was actually established before the creation of the world. Jesus was always God's plan A. He was not a reaction to man. Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh. In other words, as it relates to humanity, as it relates to his flesh, he was the son of David. In the man Jesus, he was the son of David. The Greek word is expermatos. Expermatos. From the seed of David, Paul is emphasizing his full humanity. In other words, Jesus wasn't play-acting. He wasn't masquerading. He wasn't an apparition. He was literally born of the flesh. Paul says in Galatians 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption 
as sons. We know from Matthew's gospel and from Luke's gospel that Jesus was conceived miraculously by the Holy Spirit, that his mother Mary was a virgin. However, both Joseph, who I would call a stepfather, an adoptive dad, and Mary can trace their lineage back to David. You see, Matthew traces Joseph's lineage back to David through Solomon, the rightful heir of the throne. And Luke tracks Jesus' genealogy through Mary and goes back to David through his other son, and now I'm drawing a blank on that son's name. But it goes all the way back to Adam. So Matthew's concern is the the inheritance, the, the claim to the throne of David, and Luke's concern is the biology. And it goes all the way back to Adam because Luke's concern is taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And this is a Messiah, the Davidic Messiah for all people, not just for the Jews. Now, this is part of what Paul means when he says that it refers to promises that are made in the Scriptures. One example of this comes in 2 Samuel 7, 16. It says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is God promising David that his throne would be established forever. Forever is a long time, yeah? And when God says forever, that's what he means, forever. Well, guess what? There's no human king sitting on the throne of David. But as it relates to the flesh, as it relates to the biology, God has fulfilled that in the person of Jesus Christ. David's throne sits vacant according to the flesh. But according to the flesh doesn't give us the whole story, does it? No, Paul tells us in verse 4, Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God does not mean that Jesus became the Son of God at His resurrection. Paul is not telling the reader that Jesus' status changed from not the Son of God to the Son of God at the resurrection. The first principle of biblical exegesis is let Scripture interpret Scripture. Listen, you're going to be reading in your own personal studies. You're going to go home, and you're going to develop an attitude of getting into the Word on a daily basis, and you're going to be opening the Scripture, and you're going to be reading, and you're going to read a verse like that, and your first thought is going to be, at the resurrection, Jesus became the Son of God. And it might be confusing. And you might develop a whole theology about Jesus off of one misunderstood Verse And so the first principle of biblical exegesis, of rightly understanding God's Word, is let Scripture interpret Scripture. So when something is confusing, go to a, a verse, go to other verses that are not confusing. So let's go to a couple verses that are not confusing, like John 1, 1 and 2 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh. Who are we talking about here? Jesus. The Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. So back up. Beth, one slide. In the beginning was Jesus. Yeah? And Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. All right? So let's go go forward. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The author of Hebrews opened his letter long ago at many times, and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also what? Created the world. 
So Jesus was not only with God and was God, but it was also Jesus who created the world. Paul is not telling us that Jesus became the Son of God. No, he's telling us something different. What about Jesus himself in his own words, John 6, 38 through 40? Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven. How many of you, in describing your origins, would ever say, I have come down from heaven? I came from mommy. When a mommy and daddy love each other, it's my origin. Jesus says, I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of who? My Father. My Father. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So when did Jesus become the Son of God? Never. He always was. It's called the eternal sonship of Jesus. He's always been God, the Son of God. He stepped into time and into space and into humanity somewhere around 0 A.D., right? All of history is revolving around him. He steps into space and into time. He did not become the Son of God at the resurrection. The Son was always the Son. It's important. Why do I, why do I emphasize this? Because there's plenty of heresies related to the deity of Christ, well, and the humanity of Christ, as well. In fact, one of the things that, that I miss going back to the, to the uh, according to the flesh, that he was a descendant of David according to the flesh, there's a heresy called docetism. D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M. Docetism. It was a denial of Jesus' full humanity. They, they teach that because, because the flesh is corrupted, because physical creation is corrupted, that, that a holy God could never step into the flesh. But Jesus came, and, and at the resurrection, he, he says, touch my hands. See my physical body. He ate. He, he was physical. He's, he's human. And Paul wants us to be sure that we understand Jesus was fully human. Well, one of the other ways that we can err here is to deny that he was also fully divine. And there's a heresy called Arianism or adoptionism. It came about in the 4th century A.D. And a man named Arius denied that Jesus was fully God from the beginning. The argument is that Jesus was the most faithful man and that at his resurrection, Jesus adopted him to become his son. Well, there's a major problem with that. There's a major problem with saying that Jesus was the most faithful man ever to walk the earth, and God blessed him by making him his son. The problem is that it means before the crucifixion that the man on the cross was a man and not God, a man that was born in sinful flesh, a man who would be dying for his own sins and not able to atone for your own. He would have been disqualified to take away your sins, and you, brother and sister, would still be indebted to a holy God for your sin. If Jesus is not both fully man and fully God, his death on the cross is meaningless. If his body was not literally nailed to the cross, if he did not literally shed human blood, and if he, was, if he was not literally sinless, the very substance of God, the, the theological term is homoousios, of the same substance with God, then all of it would be for nothing. Now what is concerning is that a recent Ligonier survey found that 65% of evangelical Christians I, I emphasize evangelical because these are people that say God's word is, a, is authoritative. 
and a person must be born again to be saved, 65% of evangelical Christians believe that Jesus is God's, what, uh, let's see, first and greatest being created by God. 65% of our peers, 65% of people in the evangelical church would agree Jesus is the first and greatest created being by God. They think that what they're doing is they're giving Jesus props. He's the first and greatest. But what they're actually doing is completely wiping the legs out from the gospel. If Jesus is not God himself, And if Jesus has not always been God, then his death on the cross has no power to forgive you your sins. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. Doctrine matters. Heresy matters. Needless to say, that's not what Paul is teaching. Rather, what Paul is teaching when he says that that he was declared the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead is that the resurrection from the dead declared or proved or gave evidence. Finally, it, it, the, the Greek word is related to horizon. So it horizoned that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He says it, 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 it uh, declared in power or powerfully, convincingly, it, 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 definitively. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How do we know that? Because God raised him from the dead. He really died, and he really rose again. If you're a serious-minded person, then you want to know that the person you're called to place your faith and trust in, and subsequently all of your hope for life after death, is the real deal. And the question is, how do you know? How do you know that Jesus wasn't just another religious teacher? Like Muhammad. How do you know that he wasn't just a prophet uh, or a self-proclaimed prophet like Joseph Smith? How do you know that when you put your faith in Jesus, that that's going to work? That that's going to save? How do you know? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is God's stamp of uh, this he is this is of me this is the way jesus death burial and resurrection is acceptable to god it came from god it's of god and the resurrection proves it powerfully i want to point out here that in this opening salutation if you if you, if you thought this was deep, remember, we're still in the greeting. We're still in the dear so-and-so portion of the letter. And so far, we have deep theology. We have the deity of Christ. We have the incarnation. We have the supremacy of Christ. We have the Trinity. Do you see the Trinity in this salutation? When Paul says the spirit of holiness, that was a Hebrew way of saying the Holy Spirit. It was a typical Hebrew way of saying the Holy Spirit. So you have God, who is the Father of the Son. You have the Son of God, and you have the Holy Spirit. Our God is one God in three persons, eternally existent, perfectly united. Now, here's another heresy. It's called modalism. And there are people today that are teaching it that call themselves evangelical Christians, or Christians at least. They teach modalism. They teach that God was the Father in the Old Testament, became the Son in the New Testament, and is the Holy Spirit today. False. False. Folks, why, why, I hope you're not bored with this. Like, People are putting their faith in a Jesus that's not real. And they're going to experience eternal consequences for that. You think, well, what, you ever wonder what's the problem with the Mormon church and the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, the problem is that they essentially follow the doctrines of Arian. They, they're Arianists. 
they teach that Jesus was made God, that he lived a, a good life, a good enough life, that he could be made God. He could be adopted as God. And here's the, here's the good news. If you're a Mormon, if you do the same thing, you also can have your own universe. You also can become God. But that is not true. Folks, we need to be aware of these things. Doctrine and heresy matter. The gospel of God concerns the Son of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is about Jesus. It's not fundamentally about me or you. We're pretty egocentric people. We want to say the gospel is about us, but the gospel is about Jesus. The gospel is about Jesus, the Son of God, and what God did in sending His own Son God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And Jesus so loved his father that he came willingly. He wasn't made to go, wasn't forced to go. He came willingly and became like us. No person has ever condescended like Jesus. What does it mean to condescend? Well, you can speak in a certain way that's condescending, and that is to speak down to people. But to condescend means to go down low. It means to, to take yourself low. No human being has ever condescended like Jesus. Now, Jesus Christ is not his formal name. It's not his first and last name. Actually, that would be Jesus of Nazareth. If you wanted his formal name, how he would be known, Jesus of Nazareth. No, Christ or Jesus Christ means Jesus the Christ. Christ means anointed one. Christ is Greek for anointed one, just as Messiah is Hebrew for anointed one. He's the anointed one. He's the set-apart one. He's the answer to man's problem. He's the solution. Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's brother, he's friend, he's savior, he's teacher, he's rabbi. All of these titles apply to Jesus. All of these come from the New Testament. But no title quite fits Jesus better than Lord. And Paul loves to use this combination, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. In a day where Caesar ruled and reigned as Lord over all, This was quite controversial to call Jesus Lord. It was a statement. Someone is higher than Caesar. Probably why Caesar did not take to that very kindly when the Christians began to multiply and proclaim that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar. It gives new meaning to Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. It just rolls off the tongue, right? We have that memorized. If you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Jesus is Lord. Well, when Paul wrote that, to actually say those words, might cost you your life. I wonder, would it roll off your tongue so easily if it came at the cost of your life? Jesus is Lord. Now, it might be scary to think, man, I don't know what it might cost me or what it might cost my kids or what it might cost my grandkids to declare Jesus is Lord, that He is supreme that he has total power. I, I like the term imperium, I-M-P-E-R-I-U-M, not like the store, which begins with E. I Google searched that to make sure I had, had it right, and I searched it with an E, imperium, and it's, I think it's a women's uh, clothing store. It starts with an I, imperium, total, absolute authority over everyone and everything. Jesus has that authority. It might be scary for us to think about what might it cost us to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I'll tell you that it's scarier to imagine what it will cost you if you don't. He was given 
the name above all names, the only name by which man is saved. And it will be before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ that every man, woman, and child will bow their knees and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. Whether they believe it in this life or not, every single tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and let me just point out that on that day, it will be too late for you to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and receive eternal life. It might cost you your life to confess Jesus is Lord, but it will cost you your soul to not. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead by the Holy Spirit in power is the only declaration that we need to know without question that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the Son of God. Now, a few questions for reflection this morning as we close. Has the resurrection of Jesus Christ impacted your heart? Has it been horizoned for you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That He always was and always will be? Has it occurred to you and dawned upon you that this Jesus Christ, our Savior, is Lord of all the earth and all the universe and everything there is? Is there anything that comes to your mind when I ask you the question, what do you currently refuse to submit to Him? What do you currently refuse to submit to Him? Don't allow this moment to pass. Don't brush that off. What did the Holy Spirit bring to your mind when I asked that question? What are you holding on to and saying, I will not let go, Lord Jesus? I want to invite you to let go. Not because of fear, but because of faith. Because Jesus is a gentle Savior and gentle Lord. Because God demonstrated his love for us and that he sent Jesus Christ to die for us. I want to invite you to let go of these things. Give them into the hand of a loving, merciful Savior. How do you need to experience the love of God today? Brother and sister, you have been forgiven of your sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Perhaps this morning you need to be reminded that God loves you enough that he sent Jesus to die to take away all your sin, even the sin you committed this morning getting into the car when you yelled at your wife or husband or kids. Or what you looked at last night on the internet when your wife or kids or husband went to bed. Or what you said this week to your boss or to your staff or to whatever, whatever you've done, Jesus died for that too. Let it go. Lay it down. The blood of Jesus brought us to peace with God. Perhaps some of you need to experience the love of God today by experiencing the God of peace and the peace of God. In Jesus Christ, you have peace. You come with anxiety. You come with worry. You come with stress. You come with sorrow. You come with loss. You come with mourning, with grief, with worry, with fear. Receive freely the gift of grace and the peace that surpasses all understanding, which will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. 
Some of you need to experience the love of God by gently submitting to him and trusting, trusting him with your life. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Why can we do that? Because our God is a faithful, faithful God. Amen? Let's stand and sing. Hey, thanks so much for watching online. I hope that this message has inspired you to greater faith, has encouraged you, maybe convicted or challenged you. We're grateful to be able to provide this content to you online, live and on demand. If you haven't done so already, Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube so that we can get this content right to you as soon as we upload it. But you know, we believe that as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you need the body of Christ. You need the local church. And so if you're in the Quad Cities, let me invite you to personally join us in person for our gatherings on Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1040. If you're not in the Quad Cities, I want to encourage you to go find a local church that teaches the Bible, that serves the community, that loves Jesus, that gives grace. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we hope that you were blessed.